Welcome back to The Debrief. Uh, we're here again for another season of covering everything happening in the IFSC and competition climbing, finally, after a really long break. Uh, joining me today, as always, is my co-host, John Bergman, the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of Competition Climbing, available where books are sold. And our special guest uh, for today is Eddie Falk, the official IFSC photographer from 2014 up to <laughs> 2020. Yeah, not, not anymore. Uh, but of course, also the guy behind, uh, oh, that's the back cover, Circuit Climbing uh, Magazine. No longer in print, I don't think, but an incredible resource if you know somebody that has it. Um, are they still available, Eddie, through some back channel? There is very few in existence, but of course, when the book comes out and rectifies the last five years, that will be a bit of a rebirth because Perfect. at the end of the day, I was too busy to get the magazine done, even though I'd actually completed another whole ex edition, which I'd never, never released. Now I've got the time, so... There you go, and uh, of course you'll be you'll be joining in and out with video. It sounds like the difference from from North America to New Zealand is causing some uh, some little video issues here and there. But so long as we can hear you, uh, <clears throat> we should be all set. I'm just going to make sure that that is locked in. But otherwise, uh, we're here today to talk about uh, the Meringen World Cup, which just finished a couple days ago. Uh, but before that, uh, as mentioned already, uh, we're lucky to have somebody like Eddie um, who. You know, aside from being uh, a photographer, not just for the IFSC, but also for, for a bunch of brands in climbing, um, he's one of those people that really puts the journalist into photojournalist. He's essentially been this embedded reporter inside the scene, building very close relationships with uh, athletes and coaches and fans and, of course, organizers and things like that. So aside from just the photos that we see everywhere, he's really somebody with the most connections and, and really understands the facets of so many different parts of the industry. So I don't really want to beat around the bush much longer than this. You're not the official photographer for the IFSC anymore. So the question is, uh, why aren't you uh, the official photographer of the IFSC as of this season? Well, you actually touched on it in your introduction. Um, basically, they don't want a personality. They don't want someone that has an opinion, that knows the sport, anything like that. Uh, so it was very interesting for me because obviously last year was an incredibly traumatic time for everyone um, with COVID happening. And all through the year, um, Marco um, Viterati at the IFSC kept sending me emails, we need photos of this, photos of that. And even though there was no competitions happening, I was feeding them photos. But I said to them, look, you know, going to have to come online soon and discuss 2021 contract because I'm really stressed. You know, I've had no income for eight months, whatever it may be. Um, and we have a meeting and he just says, look, we think you're a conflict of interest because you are your own media channel you're not just the ifsc photographer and we want someone who's just the ifsc photographer and i said well that's fine if you pay me as a full-time employee i will be a full-time employee but if you're offering me just a travel stipend you can't expect me to not generate income um long, long and short of that was they said they only wanted to use local photographers. Uh, they did offer me the Asian comps uh, because they didn't have any Asian photographers or know any Asian photographers or were too lazy to get any Asian photographers. Um, but then I never heard any more about that anyway. So, And look, at the end of the day, I said to them very clearly, I don't care if I'm no longer the IFSC photographer because the IFSC gig is only part of who I am. What I care about is the Olympics because I worked really, really hard towards that. And, you know, in 2019, if you remember the Vail World Cup where um, I stood on stage and I got everyone to do the Paris symbol to get the photo. And around that time, uh, Anne Fennell from the IFSC came up and said, look, you're going to the Olympics. Um, we're sending you in recognition of all the hard work you've done over the years for the IFSC. And I said, fantastic. 
I then got supporting emails for that, got emails from Jerome Meyer, who's running the gig, saying, you know, it's you and Alex Boos, you're on the list, had meetings about that in Chamonix and uh, Toulouse, um, went through the whole accreditation process in January 2020, got confirmation of my accreditation, got an email from the IFSC saying, you know, they'd be in touch shortly to sort out travel and accommodation, everything else was good to go. Um, get an email from Anne Fennell again after it's been postponed saying, look, your uniform for the comp has arrived, but obviously it's not going to happen till next year, so hold off and we'll give it to you for next year. So I say to Marco Viterati, the communications guy, look, you know, I have a contract. And they come back and say, no, you don't have a contract. And I said, yeah. And they're like, well, you didn't sign a contract. And I'm like, no, but I had a verbal contract. The only reason I hadn't signed a written contract was because there were two photographers and they'd said to us in the meeting, they were deciding who would be there for the whole duration of the Olympics, which would be one of us. And the other one of us would be there for the duration of the climbing only. And so that was fine. You know, I was cool with that. I would take them at their word. A verbal contract is still legally binding. But no, they turned around and said, no, we're not going to honor it. We don't consider it legally binding. Um, you know, in that same time, I didn't apply for accreditation myself. So, you know, for Youth Olympics, I did my own accreditation. For World Games, I did my own accreditation. This time I didn't because the IFSC said up front, you're going to be our photographer. A couple of publications, one in the UK, one in the US, offered me accreditation for them. I said no because I'm going for the IFSC. And, yeah, so they, they screwed me royally because by the time they told me that, it wasn't possible to get an accreditation. So... Instead of being sent in recognition for the five or six years I took photos for them, I'm out of luck. I'm, I'm squashed. And, you know, I've been furious for the last months about it, you know, and very upset. It's driven me into depression. Uh, you know, I need sleeping pills to get to sleep. Um, you know, this affects my whole career. And I would take them to court if I had money to take them to court. I would take them straight to court for breach of contract because... It's revolting what they've done, but yeah. Anyway, sorry, sorry for the short rant. That was me. You mentioned a couple names, uh, Anne Funiel and uh, Marco Vetteretti. Marco Vetteretti is the current head of communications. I think he's only been with the IFSC for a couple of years now. Uh, Anne Funiel has been around for a while, and I think previously she was communications as well as marketing, which is like her current gig. Um, what's your? I'm, I'm assuming you've had a fairly long relationship with Anne. Um, but uh, what uh, could you could I guess my question is mostly like, uh, do you have a different type of relationship with both of those people? Like, what's the it sounds like there was a conflict between those two departments, at least in understanding Look, it, towards it, your position at the Olympics. It's hard to say because I, you know, I worked with Anne for 2015 to 2020. Um, you know, it's like any working relationship. It has its ups and downs, but it is pretty positive. And at the end of the day, if she's going to turn around and say, you are being sent in recognition, then I'm being sent. If all the staff support that and agree with that and say that, and then they turn around and take that away, well, that's, you know, it's massively disrespectful. And even if a new guy's come in, he's got to honor the company's existing um arrangements and agreements and you know for me it's just a massive lack of ethics and integrity you know i'm incredibly hurt incredibly angry um i messaged oh there i am and big um (laughs) you'll get me back you know i i messaged people on the board and said look this is happening this isn't good enough i've i've been an asset for you guys for more than half a decade. I consider myself a stakeholder in what happens in promoting the sport. And they're all like, oh, that's terrible. We'll see what we could do. And then just crickets. Not not one of them stood up for their word. So I, I just want to get your opinion on what I would see as like the first couple things that might become a problem because the conflict of interest thing doesn't make sense to me. Um, the product you provide to the IFSC is photographs and and you know, are you, have you ever been in a position where you've had to reserve a photograph for a different client like 510 that could have also been sold to the IFSC? Like, is that the kind of conflict that they're potentially worried about? 
No, the example of a conflict uh, that they gave me, which is classic in itself, is that the circuit last year uh, released that the European Championships were postponed before the IFSC did. Okay. Now, I'll be straight up there. That's not my problem that the IFSC's press release was late. Like all the media, I am on the press lists for a bunch of different federations. And the federation that was hosting had already sent out a press release saying this event is postponed. I went on social media. People were talking about it. I go, okay, here's the press release. There's no embargo date. It's, it's live now. Here's, um, you know, here's what's being said on social media. So I report on it. And then the IFSC were like, how dare you post that before us? And I'm like, well, how dare you not do your job? and get that information out first. You are the ones that should be disseminating. You should be not reacting to that information. You should be disseminating that information. So, yeah, you know, they, they said that was a conflict of interest. And, I, you know, to me, it's like, well, it's only a conflict of interest if you don't do your job in a timely manner. That's not the first time that press releases have come out slow. So I can certainly vouch for that being a, uh, you know, I can't remember that scenario specifically with the European championships, but that's not the only time where, you know, we've had to wait for news that was obvious and, you know, either shared via, you know, in my case, the CEC or whatnot, or just well known, uh, for example, you know, with the uh, Korean athletes uh, being the, um, uh, the athletes going to the Olympics, even though there wasn't an Asian championship that took like a uh, week uh. For that to be published, even though it was, you know, that, that took that took months that was absurd um yeah look they there definitely seems to be a disconnect at times between the sporting department and the communications department um i would be very curious to see what corporate experience a lot of these guys have had because you know previously i worked for a major telco for a long time in quality and compliance management and we had all these processes in place, and I don't see any evidence of any processes within the IFSC. It all seems reactionary. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, so anyway, long story short. John, can you hear me? More than half decade. Okay, sorry, I think I lost you guys for a second, but uh, but we caught the, we caught the gist. Um, uh so uh, I guess the, the, the last question on this particular topic would be um, that that conflict of, of you announcing something which was, you know, known by pretty much everybody in the scene, but, but you technically announcing it in an outside channel, that could be a possibly kind of a convenient reason for something and and i guess what i want to get at is are there possibly other reasons that you may not be the ideal photographer anymore the one that immediately comes to mind is you've been with them for a long time are you expensive at this point compared to other photographers that they may be able to hire because not just photographers which they do seem to be regionalizing now but also with commentators we're seeing you know they have a, a different commentator lined up for the north american world cups which you certainly save on on travel costs uh, in that scenario if you're not having to fly Europeans uh, over. So, do you have any sense that there may be something else? I know this is kind of suspicion and 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 whatnot, but um, but I'll I'll put it out to you if you have an opinion on on that. Yeah, look, I absolutely have an opinion on that because I think it's not just the expense. Um, I wouldn't consider myself expensive at all because my Always my arrangement with the IFSC was they would cover travel, I would give them some photos, and I would work for other clients, which was the bulk <laughs> of my income. Um, that's why they approached me, because I would already be at the comps, I'd be working for other clients. It was a symbiotic relationship. Um, now, you know, when I started to bring on interns a couple of years ago, I had a very clear call with Anne and said, you know, I'm... I'm not going to be around forever, but I'm not happy with being replaced in the short term because I've worked really hard on this. And she said, you know, there's no way anyone that's interning will take your job that we're not going to let that happen, um, which is interesting because I see one of my interns is now the North American photographer and, 
And to be honest, he wouldn't have been my first choice out of the interns I had. Um, lovely guy, but not the work ethic of probably my first three or four choices. Um, but I feel that when Marco Vitterati came in, he wanted to... He wants to put his own people in. He wants to start his own his own crew. He doesn't want the legacy of someone else's work. So, you know, which, fair enough, I, I will walk away from the IFSC job and not look back at all with regret because I've done a fantastic job. I'm happy with my work. I'm happy with what I contributed to, to the sport. <laughs> um, but... I had a contract for the Olympics and you broke that or not you, but them. And that is not acceptable that, you know, if I had the money, as I said, I'd take them straight to court, but guess what? I haven't worked for a year. I don't have the money. Um, but yeah, you have to question the ethics and the integrity of a company, which will have massive amnesia and not stand up to their own word. And yet employs Mark Lemon Estrell as an ethicist, you know, they've got a professor of ethics that works with them about how to be an ethical business. Um, and I worked with him on his book as well. I contributed to his book. And, and then that same company turns around and screws you. You're like, well, you know, pretty angry. So, Eddie, did you, um, when this all kind of happened, whenever it was a month or a couple months ago, and, and like when word got out about this, um, what was the response like from some of the the climbers, some of the top competitors on the circuit? Because I I always think of you as you're in kind of a spot where you are you you know you are you were sort of reporting it journalistically, but also since you travel to so many comps, since you travel with the competitors and whatnot, you know friendships develop. Um, so I know you're you're friends with them or some of them as much as they are subjects for your reportage. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could speak to, you know, what you heard from, uh, from some of the competitors that people listening might kind of, you know, recognize their names and whatnot. Well, I don't really want to put names into it because I think that could be potentially tricky for whoever I mentioned, but I had, you know, major federations. Um, so I'm not just talking athletes here. I'm talking federations and federations that are hosting world cups and world championships and stuff message me and go this is revolting it's unacceptable you know that the ifsc has been really unprofessional and how could they do this i've had athletes going to the olympics messaging me going no way you can't not be at the olympics you've been there for our whole ride you are part of us so to speak um i've had athletes not going to the olympics who have also messaged and said you know what what's going on what are they thinking this is ridiculous so i've had support from and and companies i've had you know several companies have messaged me and gone well because this has also been really tricky for me because part of working with companies is i was going to the olympics and that's been pulled out from under me um but the companies have all been incredibly supportive and like everyone else are basically just thinking that the IFSC has made a massive misstep. And it, it seems to be, you know, and of course people that aren't going to support me won't be the people sending me those messages. If you don't like me, you're not going to send me a message of support. But I got enough messages of support that that was really heartening. And, you know, some of them were pretty condemning of the IFSC. Um, and you got a question in the long run. If the IFSC keeps burning their assets, how long are people going to stick with the IFSC? You know, w when is the board going to get rolled? When is the IFSC going to employ climbers again? Um, because if they keep screwing people, left, right and centre, then, you know, but I, I yeah, as I said, I've, incredibly depressed about it, incredibly upset about it, lost a lot of sleep. Um, I take solace in the fact that a lot of my friends from all levels of the sport have reached out and, you know, thanked me for what I did and said that I should still be there. I will still be at the comps once COVID clears up and I can get there. 
And that'll be interesting in itself because not one of those IFSC people will be able to look me in the eye because they have no integrity. They're just gutless. And yeah, I can look at them and go, I'm a man of my word. I have my honor. Who are you? Um, just so people are aware, of course, anybody from the IFSC is always welcome to reach out. John and I would have them on the show in a heartbeat. So if, uh, if Anne, Marco are willing to come on and talk about this, we'd be happy to have them. And I'll probably reach out just to let them know that this episode is coming out. So they're at least aware of it. Um, uh, and of course, we'd love to have them. So you're always welcome to. We'd love to know more about the inside uh, of the IFSC. So you know, we, we don't intend on roasting anybody, you know, I'm, I would certainly consider myself a friend of Eddie, but I'm not gonna, not gonna just light people up. Uh, I'll let you answer questions. And of course, tell your side of the story if you want to. Um, but uh, you mentioned that you, um, you know, you're going to be at the World Cups. Anyways, um, now that you've had a, a, just a break away from the circuit, you know, where you've had this time at home, although it doesn't sound like it's been a time of peace or solitude for yourself um, how uh how does it make you feel about that lifestyle of of always being on the road and especially considering there there is now a financial change in in your scenario and no longer having that ifsc uh, money that sweet sweet big bag of ifsc cash right <laughs> um look i i obviously miss it because it's what I did for a long time. I think it takes a certain personality type to do what I did. Most people wouldn't enjoy it. They might enjoy the first six months or the first two seasons or whatever. But after that, they start to go, well, actually, I just want to be at home and have a coffee with my friends. After that, I just want to, to be normal, um, which you never really get the chance doing what I do. But the flip side is I love doing what I do. Um, I'm willing to take those day-to-day -day life sacrifices because it they're not that meaningful to me. You know, I, I don't have a family back here in New Zealand um, in so much as, you know, I don't have wife and kids or anything. My mum still lives here. But, um, yeah, I, I want to get back. I want to see my friends. I want to capture their stories. Uh, you know, it was hard for me. I was talking to Yanya a bit over the weekend. Um, I think this is the first time I've ever missed her podiuming. You know, I've been there her whole career. I've seen seen it all. Um, and so, you know, a little bit gutted about things like that. But, um, and also, yeah, it, it's kind of scary when you go out that other people will try and move in while you're not there and it's going to be harder to get back in if that makes sense and when i started doing this in 2013 no one wanted to be a comp photographer you know there was it was just like crickets and you know cobwebs and you know it was and now it's suddenly like this glamorous oh, and, and you know i feel like maybe i'm partly responsible for that people have gone look at what i did oh, wow, that looks like a good lifestyle. I want to be in on it. Whereas, as I said, half a decade ago, that was no one. No one wanted to be taking photos of comps. There was maybe half a dozen of us diehards, you know, um, myself, um, Mark DeVette, um, obviously, Luca Fonda, Heiko Wilhelm, Vladek was already there, Bjorn was already there. Apart from that, there weren't very many people at all and now you turn up and everyone and his dog's got a camera mm -hmm. um so but you know i i miss it dreadfully but i also accept that the most responsible thing to do is not be there until it is safe to do so sure um i'll give you a chance to talk about your book in a second but i just wanted to say like you know when we have you on this show the the value to us isn't that you take photographs, right? Like on this show, we don't show your photographs or anything like that. And I, I know digital media is one of those things where making value in it is incredibly hard. You can speak to that more than most people. You deal with uh, with, with copyright issues all the time. Um, but, you know, having been on the circuit for five, let's well, six seasons, but more or less five because of uh, the coronavirus pandemic, um, you know, the, the real value is 
is that experience and history and connections and, and background knowledge. And I hope you get a chance to use that stuff. You know, if, if you're available, we'll have you on this show every single time, because frankly, there aren't a lot of people who are articulate and knowledgeable and as connected as you are. And that makes you really valuable from just a general media perspective. And I also think you're an entertaining person. And that's something, you know, while I don't think it's likely, you're the kind of person I would like to have on a live broadcast, right? So um, I hope you get to use that, uh, you know, that incredible amount of value that you've built up. But back to photography, um, you are working on a book again. Um, and uh, I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about what that project is. Uh, well, for starters, just quickly, uh, seven years. Um, oh, yeah, you started before but, you had the but, job. You're right. Meow, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, two years before the IFSC, five years with the IFSC, last year, obviously, a year off um, after the IFSC. Uh, I say after the IFSC, I was contracted last year, but obviously didn't do anything mm -hmm. because, well, COVID. Um, yeah, the book, look, I always consider my work as part of creating a legacy for where the athletes are, where the sport is at a moment in time. Um, it's incredibly important to me knowing that when I'm dead and gone, a little 80 year old Yanya will be sitting there with her great grandkids on her lap, showing them photos that I took when she was a teenager or that, you know, whoever it may be, Sean McCall, when he's governor of Canada, has a framed photo that I took in the background, <laughs> whatever it may be. Um, he, he would do a great so, job of being governor general out here. Yeah, he would kill that, actually. Yeah. That's a great job for him. So, you know, for me, that's always been a big part of what I do. But because we live in a digital media era, it's very hard to get things printed yourself when, when things go to magazines that's one thing but you know for a long time I was just churning for the IFSC because of their expectations I was shoot a comp sort the photos for the IFSC sort the photos for 510 Adidas Mad Rock whoever it may be send everyone selections and then collapse in a heap and then a couple of days later I'm on the other side of the world shooting the next comp um, which is why the magazine stopped, because at the end of the day, I got too fatigued to fit it in there. And when the world stopped, I basically sat on my thumbs for probably three or four months because we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know how long it would last. And I was like, just chilling. Um, and then I went, OK, now's the time to do that book that I wanted to do. Uh, and it'll be like a Glenn E. Friedman style photo book, like coffee table, big, um, shiny photos. I'm looking at about 340 pages. Um, and it'll be thematically driven, covering the last, uh, well, 2015 to 2020 competitions. Uh, obviously, 2020 is only Studio Block and Doc Masters, but it's still in there. Um, be covering that also be covering a lot of outdoor adventures um and yeah that's sort of what's on the table it's it should have been ready to go now but with all the stuff of the ifsc you know that broke my head so badly that i got two or three months behind um and then i also sadly um lost a hard drive of eight terabytes of photos on it um, and I do have backup, but my backup's in an attic in Switzerland. Um, now, thankfully, I'd gone through almost that entirety of that hard drive and got all the photos I needed off it uh, before it died, because uh, it wasn't sick at all anyway. Long story short, it, got, it fell off my table. Um, but the only comps that I missed are... Um, Myringen 2018 and Moscow 2018. So I've got the whole last five years except for that, and I can probably find some photos from that somewhere else. And, you know, I want a couple of pages just of every podium I've ever shot. Mm -hmm. I want photos showing the emotion. I want photos showing the behind the scenes. I want photos showing the fatigue, you know, whether it be a whole section of the book of just people passed out on the ground at comps. I mean, 
because that happens and that's part of our story and it's part that maybe isn't seen but it's actually an important part of our story because if you don't tell people the driving fatigue that the setters get that the athletes get that the workers get it's very easy to think oh well you know why is such and such having a flat round today and that could be they're just exhausted Mm -hmm. so yeah um that's in a nutshell there'll be a few essays a few short quotes from climbers but 95 percent just photos just a photo coffee table book i'm really looking forward to that i'm thrilled eddie i can't wait for it you know i've felt for a long time like there's a real lack of of um literature about and focused on just the comp scene in particular now i know maybe there is more in you know you're in like french and stuff that i'm not familiar with but i just mean in in sort of english language books um there just aren't you can you could literally count on one hand as far as as far as i know um so any any book that's added to that i consider kind of like a monumental occasion and the fact that it's it's from you and it covers so much uh important you know, so many important events of the history. It's just, it's just awesome. I'm, I'm really excited for it. So. Yeah. It's look what I've done so far. I'm really pleased with, um, honestly, the first thing I did was sit down. I've got 600,000 photos and I peeled that down to about 40,000, which was my short list and to go through 600,000 photos because I could easily go, okay, I will take the, because I grade all my photos. Um, color grade in in Lightroom so I can easily select. But I wanted to go through with fresh eyes and re-look at everything because I'm doing that after a comp and quite often I'm fatigued. I might just overlook a good photo. Um, So I went back through just everything, just, you know, 600,000 plus photos. And then I got there and then I went, how do I make this into, because just a jumble, but you know, I'm, I'm almost there. So I'm pretty pleased with how it's happening. And yeah, you know, it, it'll be a good legacy item for the sport. You know, I'm hoping that a bunch of people buy it and put it on their bookshelves so that in 10, 20, 30 years time, we have that. But I mean, you know, I digress slightly, but what an amazing time of comps it was between 2000 and 2008. What a magnificent time. You remember any of it? You know any of it? Not a chance. I know I only know yeah, it just because I've written it all down myself off the fucking digital rock page over the last year. But but exactly, yeah, that's, but that's a, a huge every, point is as you know, I've um in the last, you know, month or so I've been digging into Russian speed history, uh, because that is probably the biggest black box of climbing and I need to make sense of all these speed results that I'm seeing and the relief you find when you find, uh, I think her name's Anna Pianova, uh, mm-hmm. the photographer out of Russia. And you find these articles she wrote like 17, 18, 19, 20 years ago. And you see the pictures of Rustem Gelmanov with a little dirt stash and a rat tail looking like, you know, he's 15 years old yeah. at these like, you know, backwater comps in Siberia and the the incredible feeling of revelation you find when you find those like remaining bits of climbing history somehow still on the internet is unreal so you know having the resource that you're about to put out just like kind of beyond the face was six or seven years ago whenever that came out it's so critical for those of us that want to look back yeah like beyond the face is incredible like just amazing piece of work by Heiko and that will be a big part of his legacy as well. But as you said, it is like five, six years ago now. Like I hadn't even thought about that, but yeah, it's, it's half a decade. I, I mean, think, I think it stopped out at 2014 in terms of what he was covering. If I remember right, I might be wrong, but yeah, which is, you know, by then, you know, that means that in, in its entirety, it doesn't cover Yanya. It doesn't cover, you know, probably hardly covers Anna Verhoeven probably doesn't cover Tomoe Narasaki or Zhang Wan Chan or, you know, there's, there's a generation since then already which is which is why i think media in the sport myself obviously being one of we need to preserve that legacy Mm -hmm. no kidding all right well 
uh john unless you have any we, questions, should we talk about a comp i was gonna say we can start preserving the legacy of maringen 2021 if you guys want to. <laughs> sure yeah i mean i would just say eddie please you know whenever the book either when it comes out or or even before then if you want to give kind of more of a preview it'd be awesome to just you know have you kind of talk more about it uh whenever it's approaching its release um because i think it's something that anybody certainly anybody that watches this show uh would would want a copy of it i would imagine so um you know i'd love to hear more as it progresses yeah i'll be uh i'm sure we'll, we'll all be in line to buy it so make sure you let us know um but let, let's hit the comps uh Maring in 2021 first comp of this season we don't know how long the season is going to be we honestly have no idea we're pretty certain that salt lake city is going to run it's technically been officially confirmed they're going to do two dates in about a month a boulder event and a boulder plus speed back to back so that'll be fun uh but let's not get ahead of ourselves um starting i think in the european championships from uh from last year we decided to switch up the format of this show to cover the big headline and then to talk about the uh, the biggest winners and biggest losers of this thing and I get to go first with headlines. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. And if we want to talk about IFSC media, this is, you know, a thread to uh, to tug at. Yanya Garnbrett, already the greatest female competition boulderer of our time, takes one step towards becoming possibly the greatest competitive climber in the history of forever uh, by now breaking the record for the longest streak of World Cups won back-to-back -back, uh, now with eight World Cups starting all the way back in Munich 2018 going all through 2019 and then winning this in Maringen. Nobody's ever won eight in a row before. In bouldering the record is held by Sandrine LeVay from 2003-2004 where she did six in a row plus a World, uh, world Championship. Um, aside from that, the people you think of, like Anna Storr has only won four in a row, Shauna Coxie, four in a row, Akio Noguchi, four in a row, and that's as many as you get. Um, the next best competition for, for Yanya is in lead, where you've seen Robin Urbisfeld win seven in a row in 93, 94, I think it was, Jakob Schubert in 2011, and then, of course, um, Angie Eider, who is the one that Yanya really has to dethrone when it comes to competition greatness. She did seven in a row, uh, plus a world championship lost one event. And by lost, I mean, came second to Maya Vidmar and then won another seven in a row. So there's, there's some competition there, but Yanya has a new record aside from being the first person to clean sweep a season. Um, just, you know, she's slowly knocking off these achievements and while I think has been made mention in a bunch of articles written in the last couple of days, you know, she isn't the biggest winner of all time yet, but her podium record, as as you mentioned, Eddie, is immaculate, second only to Oriane Berton's youth career, which <laughs> seems to be possibly even better. But aside from that, no. like, I can't say enough how incredible that is. And then second is how in my basement am I the one saying that like that? That should be on the broadcast, in my opinion. It should be in the press release. It should be out there, but it's not. And that needs to be fixed. And did you did you see the press release? I did see the press release. Adam did Wander gets 20 they... gold medals. <laughs> yeah, and Yanya won her seventh consecutive seventh World Cup. Seventh in a row, yeah. So they, they had all this time. They, they could have built this story. Yep. And... You know, they the biggest story they didn't even get the stats right, and that's really problematic because that is the standard that goes out to every media around the world, and they then print that. So, when you put an error like that in, it under you know, if I was Yanya, if I was the Slovenian team, if I was a sponsor of Yanya, I would be furious because you're underselling the biggest story in climbing that all the stakeholders in it are being ripped off. Um, but just, I mean, Yanya, just un unreal. And the thing is, as unreal as she is, always got to look over her shoulder because how good is the next generation? Mm -hmm. We are seeing the first generation of kids that grew up watching Yanya become climbers. And that, that's going to change things up because previously the generations were watching... Maya Vidma, Mina Markovic, Jai and Kim, um, Anna Store, whoever it may be. And, and you can see in these kids when they come through, they emulate stylistic aspects. 
and then suddenly you get Natalia Grossman, you get Ariane Baton, you get, um, you know, sadly we lost Luce Doherty, who was incredibly of that style as well. But they are emulating Yanya. They are little Yanyas. They are not little Anna Stores or little Giant Kims. And that's going to switch it up. That's going to change the face of the sport over the next five years. Yeah, just briefly to follow up on that, just talking about generationally, like, you know, uh, Oriane born in 2005. Uh, that means they're kind of hitting that point. Like kids, most of the time, start getting really into climbing around the 9, 10, 11, 12 range, right? So we're talking about somebody mm -hmm. that kind of came of age as a child in uh, like 2000, um, sorry, yeah, 2015 ish, which is kind of where we start to see this new evolution of like parkour climbing. These aren't people that learned how to climb and then had to figure out how to run and jump and dyno and and do all this stuff that Udo Newman like goes mega brain over in terms of movement, right? Like this is what they've been yeah. doing from the start and it's evident that they were in this is the stuff they were climbing when they started loving bouldering. It's really incredible. Sorry John, I, you were about to say something. No, I I was just going to jump sort of on on what you were all saying. It's it's getting harder and harder for me and for you too, Tyler. You and I have been very very cautious about about giving that title of the greatest competition climber of all time to to Yanya, right? We've we've seen other people use it in media and whatnot, and you and I are always kind of like, well, maybe, but it's a little too early to tell. It just feels like <laughs> like every competition that happens, it gets a little harder and harder to sort of uh, uh, justify putting your your foot on the brake there a little bit because it's just she does something else that's incredible, and and little by little you're like, well, yeah, maybe, gosh, maybe she, you know, maybe we should be just sort of unanimously agreeing that she's that she's the greatest of all time i don't know if i'm quite ready to do that yet because she she she's still so young you know i want to see some longevity on the circuit i think that counts for something uh but certainly in terms of accolades in terms of in terms of the streak um inarguable at this point mm -hmm. i mean I uh, so I, if i can um i'm going to talk on that one she's still so young i mean she did her first World Cups in 2016, so 16, 17, 18, 19. I think you know, she did she's a couple, five years into her career. Did she do one or two did in 2015, I think? Uh, just like a uh, Sorry, three, three and 15. Three yeah. lead and 15 because her coaches wanted to bring her in slowly, so they only got her to do the three European lead World Cups, and, of course, she got three podiums. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of sport, they always say you measure the greatness of a climber, or, sorry, they measure the greatness of an athlete because – other sports aren't climbers, on their bad days, not their good days. And Yanya's bad days are most climbers in the world's absolute highlight reel. Yeah, no kidding. You know, when, when you've missed two finals in your career, that, that's, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, so, yeah, we can look at the victories and go, well, that's what defines her. But the foundation is the bad days. And when the bad days are usually still a podium, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, she, she's, she's a wee bit special. Yeah. Her floor, I, um, her floor is incredibly high. You're, you're absolutely, yeah, you're right about that. Yeah. I, I messaged her um, after qualifying, see how it was. And, and she just came back and was like, it was really easy. And then we started talking about her hair color because her hair color was more important <laughs> to her at that time than... <laughs> You know, I said, I like the hair. She's like, yeah, yeah, I did it especially for this comp. I'm like, look, and, and that was because for her, the qualifiers were done and dusted. She wasn't even registering them anymore. She had already moved on. Her focus had moved on. But yeah, just a. Yeah. I, I, I want to speak to, to John mentioning the hesitance to, to designate somebody as like the, the greatest of all time or like the goat or whatever you want to want to call them. And the, the reason I'm hesitant going back to what Eddie was talking about is that there are other incredible climbers from the past. And for some of them, I was barely alive. For some of them, I was climbing, but not paying attention to the comps. But most importantly, for a lot of those streaks, there isn't any video of. I can't go back and watch these climbers. And I can't go back and hear commentary about how they interact with their field. In some cases, I can't go back and actually know how high they got on a route compared to someone else, right? And I think the, you know, this is something where, something I'm going to try and organize, you know, closer to the Olympics is get some people that have been around for that long and 
ask them just for their eye test and for their memory, because I know it's so easy to judge the people of the present day to be the greatest just because we live alongside them. There's a certain amount of enthusiasm for the people that you get to witness, the people who are of your generation. But I, I don't know how to accurately judge against people who I basically have nothing to watch. You know, Angie Eider, the number of wins she had in those couple seasons was fucking unreal. And the likelihood of Yanya matching that is low for most like, you know, she can certainly do it, but it's an incredible feat that she hasn't done yet. Right. Like it's still to come. And I can't, you know, just predict that she's going to do things. The pressure is rising on Yanya. Last year was relatively easy. Like Shauna Coxie was out for a lot of it. Mio Nanaka was out for a bunch of it. That like, that was a relatively weak final season. And, and so trying to relate those factors to what Angie Eider may have had to deal with or what Sandrine LeVay would have had to deal with, although obviously the fields were much smaller back then, I'm not the person to judge that. And so I think we should go slowly when willing to give a crown for like the greatest competition climber of all time. I think we should be gentle and understand what we're saying, because if you're going to claim somebody's the greatest and you have to explain why they're better than the next guy. And if you can't tell me anything about the next guy then you don't know what you're talking about. And so I think that's why, like, put the brakes on, acknowledge that Yanni is by far the best climber of today, like, no doubt, or best competition female climber of today, but you do have to do a little extra work before you start throwing around big words. And that's something I've had to, like, learn myself because I'm sure I've said ridiculous shit in the past. Um, so, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, learn more myself. So that's the fight uh, that I deal with. Yeah, it's also another thing to that is, I mean, it's just the obvious is that it, there's it's way more of a competitive field now. There's way more kids getting into climbing, competition climbing in 2021 um, or, you know, in 2015, kind of when, when Yanya was getting into the adult scene, as there would have been in the early 2000s and whatnot. It's it's kind of like great greatness and being the goat is almost self-defeating in the sense that you're just inspiring <laughs> the next generation to come and like better your accomplishments and sort of take take the claim the throne um people you know angie eider she was so great that she inspired other people to take to take on climbing and to start competition climbing and and same with yanya she's so great her greatness is just going to beget more greatness because she's going to inspire people uh, more people to climb which oddly enough sort of risks chipping away at her own legacy in a way um but that's kind of how the the progression of goats uh, you know it, it, it that that's how it works and that's why it's fun to follow through the generations yeah, yeah. um eddie, eddie what, what, uh, what what for you any big, big takeaways like headline, headline for yourself for this comp aside, aside from, from the yanya thing, thing. um are we talking into we're not on the winners now are we no, not, not, not just like, yet not just yet um Look, there were definitely a couple. Um, I think for me, I, I wrote down so much that it's almost hard to hard to choose. <laughs> um, I one thing I'll say is I loved that qualifying, or most of qualifying at least, was available to watch, um, even though we didn't get an English commentary on it. Because obviously for myself, I'm at these comps, but for the vast majority of fans around the world, they don't get to see the comp unless there is one in their area. And I think it's great because you always see the haters and they're like, oh, you know, it's all parkour, it's not real climbing, blah, blah, blah. But when you sit there and you watch those five qualifying climbs and then you watch those four semis climbs, you're like, they got to do a lot of straight up climbing before they get to the showy finals problems. There's a lot of just standout hard bouldering and showing the qualifiers let let the people see that. So I think it was it was great to see because people I don't know assume that we're all in a jungle gym swinging around sideways and of course 90% of a world cup isn't like that and yeah that was the big thing for me was seeing that was you know, really grateful to the Hasseltel Mountain Festival for giving people that opportunity. I think it'll enlighten a lot of people in the community. I entirely agree. I think, uh, um, you know, the biggest thing is just for simply for diehards, people that love watching, you know, what problems are being set in a World Cup or trying to understand why somebody made it to semifinals. Um, it's an incredible resource. And, and fortunately, that's going to hopefully be on YouTube for a long time for people to 
to look back at. Uh, but yeah, your point about uh, about qualifiers, take a wall that holds eight problems in finals. You have to make it fit 10 for qualifiers. So these climbs are bottom to top, relatively straight up and down. They're simple climbs for the most part. They can't go laterally very much because there's so much action on the wall. And so they do become pulley thug fest, you know, crimpy, whatever, but they can't do all this lateral running and jumping. Um, the quality of the climbs really does change through um, through the rounds. And and like you said, finals is, is influenced by the fact that it is a big show. Um, but there's a reason why these climbers get there. They're, they're, they're not, as you said. So that's a great point. And um, I doubt that we'll get to see qualifiers for uh for many other comps we'll talk about that later um but i'm glad we got a chance this time especially after so long away from it it was uh it was really nice to get a little bonus content uh this go around um john what about you headline for the weekend yeah you know my headline was just <laughs> how great it was USA nonsense isn't it well no it was just how great it was to have a, a world cup competition back you know i i don't think we kind of glossed over it uh but like <laughs> that's a really important thing as we've learned from this whole past year not having them um i was just delighted this whole weekend it's i mean i know we had brian son i guess last year but that was kind of a uh a unique case um but I was just kind of giddy the whole weekend when I was watching all these rounds. I was just so stoked to have comp climbing back. It felt great. Um, I think um, it seemed like the fan base was really excited, too. I, I think that the pandemic has kind of enlivened everyone, certainly me, to just like appreciate it when we have it because we know what it's like when we don't have it. Um, and when the circuit, you know, gets gets postponed or canceled or something like that, um, just just felt great. I had a smile on my face the whole weekend when I was watching these these rounds. You can probably tell that there's a lot of new viewers too, because as Eddie found out, the amount of people in the chat for qualifiers that didn't have a fucking idea what was going on, it was pretty unreal. And it was very helpful that people like you were there to answer over and over things about groups, but I'm going to complain about that but, later but, probably. I mean, but how good is that? That shows that there's an interest. It shows that there's people who maybe just came across it on YouTube who weren't fans who then went, Oh, okay. Now I'll watch semis. Now I'll watch finals. Like, you know, the, the qualifiers becomes an advertisement and you know, obviously the comp was a dreadful time for me, but I stayed up and watched every round because it's what I do, mm -hmm. which means, you know, woman's qualifying, I think finished at six in the morning for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so I watched all night, but it tells the story. And when you saw like, just the group of death and qualifying. I mean, oh my goodness, what a group of death. And you, you know, and it's sometimes it's lack of a draw when it's been so long since everyone's got ranking points that that group B and women's qualifying was absolutely loaded. And, and yeah, oh, I'm assuming that's you guys uh, in my trouble. Sirens? Yeah, it's probably me. My bad. Yeah, but you know, having that and see. The drama that we got to see just in qualifying was incredible. And no no stream, no drama. You just look at the results the next day and go, Oh, Fanny had a bad round. Oh, Chloe had a bad round. You don't you don't feel the tension. You don't feel the the excitement. And you know, I I loved having that. Um, I don't know if you were reading the comments as they went through. The one thing I've got to say to everyone is be respectful when you comment. Why do people comment different than they talk? Like, this is terrible, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to even watch. And I mean, I've, you may have seen someone said, well, I'm not going to watch. And I was like, okay, no one's making you. Yeah. Like, you know, just, just go away. <laughs> yeah. It's the easiest way for all of us to not have to deal with this is you go away and stop talking to us and the problem is solved for yeah. everybody. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. If you're not enjoying it, you're not, no one's holding a, big stick over you saying you must enjoy this if it's not your thing bye like yeah, yeah. all in all though the the what i would say is like you know so much because we we've a lot of last year we talked about whether or not the ifsc should have chat running and i've personally been a bit of a proponent i think john as well uh was in favor of the chat being there just because for so many people like you said they stumble upon this and they don't have a way to learn more about it it's a really easy way for people to to ask questions and also just see where the enthusiasm is coming from and talk about it now the internet's the internet and people are terrible at, you know that's like that's just how it's go it's it's going to be there everywhere but if you embrace it and you understand what kind of medium you're broadcasting on 
on. It's not hard to deal with that, right? There are so many broadcasts that happen on the internet who handle this stuff. Um, you just get, you know, a, like a volunteer moderator team is really easy to make happen and you deal with that stuff and you just, uh, you cut it off at the head, right? Um, so it's not hard yep. to deal with and I think it's definitely a net benefit, especially if you treat it properly. Um, so yeah, great, great news for, uh, for everybody. Um, we're kind of talking about winners anyways. So, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about biggest winners, uh, from, from the weekend and Eddie, I'll have you go first, uh, with this one who, uh, who blew away expectations or, or gained the most from this? Well, wow, see, see, I feel like I'm coming from so left field. Do it. I, on, I love on all it. my answers. Let's go. Um, my biggest winners for the weekend are the brands that have sponsored the athletes and stood by them for all this time with no competitions, no exposure. And then suddenly they get a payday when, you know, your, your Adidas 510, you're sponsoring Yanya. And no one's seeing much except for these little Instagram clips of her on a training wall. Suddenly she comes and crushes and it's everywhere. And that's what the sponsors have been waiting for. And, you know, we're incredibly fortunate within the sport that most of the brands have stood by their athletes, even in tough times, even when they're not making a lot of money because people aren't climbing because of lockdowns and stuff. And fantastic to see a good comp that was well received that gave exposure to all these athletes and by default when you expose the athletes you expose the sponsors so my big winner was effectively the sport and the the industry who are getting finally some exposure after a a pretty dark time can you talk a bit about like sponsorship relations? Because you you yourself are I, maybe sponsored isn't the right word. Maybe some of them are sponsorships, but you partner with brands uh, uh, for for your product. Um, and of course, I'm sure you 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 speak with athletes. Um, what's the? Could you talk maybe a bit about what the 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 sponsorship space looks like in in these last like year or two compared to maybe when you first got on the scene, like. Is it is it getting notably better for athletes, or is it really just benefiting a, a certain part of the field? Any any comments you want to make? I feel that there is a trickle down. It's definitely getting better at the top end of the field. Um, sponsorship, on the whole, is a whole nother discussion in itself. And to be honest, it's a discussion you really want the likes of Robin Ebersfield Rabatou in for, or people like that, because they saw the glory days of sponsorship when it was Robin, Lynn, um, Catherine Desterville, um, Patrick of Edlanger, Didier Rabatou, people like that. And they were getting big money. Um, and then sponsorship crumbled in the nineties because the next generation were coming through. They were still living at home and the brands realized they could offer these kids a pair of shoes and some travel money. And they'd consider themselves sponsored and that undercut, all the professionals in the sport. Um, and it's taken, I think, 20 years for that really to rebound to the level where you're seeing climbers successfully, successfully living off competition. But, you know, I think at the beginning of competition, around the late 80s into the very early 90s, the top competition climbers were already living from competition sponsorship. And I would say that it's probably not till about 2012, 2013 that we maybe started to see, oh, maybe even like, maybe even more recently than that, people living off competition sponsorship. And by that, I'm not saying that it's not good supplementary income, but it's a sole stream of income. And I'm not talking sponsored climbers in general. I'm not talking your Dave Grahams and your, your predominantly outdoor climbers. I'm talking competition sponsorship. Um, but now I think with the increased visibility, you are seeing the Tomoe and Arasaki's Mio Nanaka, you know, Mio Nanaka in Beats by Dre. You know, it's they are legitimate known athletes on the global stage. And yeah, hopefully they're making some good money. I don't know the details of a lot. I know what some get paid by certain sponsors only but it's you know it's such a because they if you've got five sponsors and you've got five, your fingers in five different jars 
-hmm. and each of those arrangements could be different because you might have a sponsor which pays you a flat fee every year. This is your sponsorship. We're going to pay you on the 1st of March every year. Bang. You might have another sponsor which is paying you, um, oh, what's the word? Begins with C, contingency checks. And that is going to be, you know, if so if you're Yanya and you have a contingency check sponsor, then you're doing incredibly. Because that contingency check might be they match your prize money every time you make prize money. Or they give you a thousand dollars, a thousand euro every time you make a final. So you might have a retainer and then contingency checks. And for, as I said, for an, if an athlete like Yanya is on that, then... Um, and this is how it existed back in the 80s and 90s. You'd get someone like Robin Ebersfield would win a competition and she might get two and a half thousand euros prize money as it was back then or whatever it would be. But then she might get that matched by three or four sponsors. So that actually becomes a 10,000 euro competition. Um, so look, it's an incredibly complex and deep discussion, but short answer, yes, I think climbers are getting a better living out of it, but we need to respect the sponsors in turn. We need to make sure they're getting value for money. So they stay in the sport. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think the big winner for this weekend was the sponsors because it gave that exposure that, you know, they, they want exposure. That's, that's why they're here. That's why they're sponsoring. And bam, if you're, 510 um, Adidas or if you're Sportiva with Adam whoever you know you, you've justified a year's sponsorship just in the exposure they get from this first comp after forever especially if they keep doing close ups of uh, Adam's shoes on, on men's number two that was some good uh, <laughs> good publicity <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if you did you hear the root did you watch the root setting Nikki's summary of the video? comp yeah, 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 yeah. I, I just loved it because he's like and adam's in the fairies which is supposed to be the best sh comp shoe and oh his foot slipped <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all publicity like, well is good played, publicity Nikki. whatever it's all good john what about yeah. you um any any particular winners from this <clears throat> great point eddie and and like eddie i could pick and there's a number of things i could pick at but i will say um i'll say akio naguchi and the reason i'm saying her here is because it kind of dovetails with what we were talking a few minutes ago about um, about Yanya and about the 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 next generation being inspired by Yanya that is now you know that generation is now competing with Orion and and those types of people, um, but in in that conver in that part of the conversation we failed to mention that there is somebody who is still competing who actually uh, who actually inspired Yanya. Yanya has actually admitted that that Akio was kind of the icon that she looked up to when, when Yanya got into the sport, into the competing. Um, and yet here we are, you know, not only is this next generation appearing on the podium, this, these 16 year old kids, but you have, of course, Yanya still on the podium, but then you have Akio, who's kind of like that generation, even older than, than Yanya still performing at a high level, you know, almost making podium here. She, she got fourth place, um, just misses out on the podium by one spot. Uh, just it's incredible that she's competing at at such a high level still incredible that she'd made finals and even more incredible that she placed so well in finals so akuna gucci um you know one of my winners that's and uh, i mean the Shout out to Natalie Berry mentioned in her piece that, you know, Akio has been competing on the world stage since before Orianne was born basically in the same year. You know, she, I think she podiumed at that world championship in 2005. Yep. Uh, so, uh, you know, tying, tying those generational things together. Yeah. If, if not a win in results, a win in just, you know, being a legend, um, whether or not this is her last year, just, yeah, yeah, seeing her in finals was uh, was incredible and consistent too. That was something, actually, you know, I should just talk about my winner and we can keep it all together. Nobody brought it up, so I'm I'm going to make my my big winner kind of a little broad just to squeak one thing in. Um, so I'm going to say the, like, the, the people behind the show. I'm going to shout out mainly the Root Setters, but also the broadcast team. Um, the graphics look great this year. I thought the quality of a lot of pieces of the broadcast 
were, were much better and they look like something befitting of an Olympic sport. Mac Room did a great job, you know, settling into that. And Stassi Gayho was the perfect co-commentator for a very slow finals. She provided that, you know, just something to talk about as we watched people in a lot of cases not get very far up on the wall. Um, and for the most part, we had a clock on the screen during finals. Not always, but for the most part, we had a clock on the screen for most of the finals. So, so good job with that. Also, shotgun mics at the top of the wall, getting to hear some screams. Some people have screams that I wouldn't have expected came out of those people, which I thought was fascinating. So, <laughs> so that was great. But I, my, I, go ahead. I was going to say the screams to me was one of the funniest bits when yeah. you watched Akio going full noise. <laughs> Yeah. And then Matt Groom comes and goes, see, she just looks graceful and strong. And you've just heard her on the screen and maybe yeah. Matt couldn't hear it. Just like yeah. growling her way up the problem. Incredible grunt. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, but so in, in the theme of organizers, the big one I wanted to point out was uh, the root setters. Um, and I'm, you know, I finals was hard. It was a, a hard final, relatively few tops relatively few flashes it did feel somewhat slow through a lot of those uh climbers unfortunately but for coming out of like a two-year gap of not getting to see these people climb having unbelievable wild cards coming into the scene along with a bunch of athletes who you know but who are at a different phase in their training than they normally would be coming into Maringen. And then putting up some of the problems they did, getting the separation they did. Like, if you look at the women's podium, that podium stayed consistent all the way through qualifiers. Like, they were getting the right people at the top of each round. They kept it the whole way through. And then, like, some of the problems, like, um, semifinal number four, the, uh, I think... It was Yanya, no Yanya wasn't the only person to top it. I think three people topped it, uh, but that was the gray volumes basically forming what kind of looked like a slopey volume ladder. Problems like that where it just opened up the the creativity to climbers and gave us a window into the actual separation of the field after a qualifiers, which kind of muddled that qualifiers made everybody look like they were pretty much mm -hmm. on the same page. And then semifinals really showed, especially with Yanya basically campusing the bottom part of that route was incredible. Um, what were the other ones I wrote down? Um, women's, where'd my problem notes go? Oh, there they are. Um, yeah, women's number two, uh, the triple dino around the corner was a showstopper and getting to see three different types of beta coming through was awesome. And it gave Orian a place to really shine, um, was, was excellent. I loved her. What I interpreted as like very junior uh, beta at the top, this kind of uncertainty about big moves towards the end of a problem and using, you know, very, very junior style kind of mounting onto the onto the sphere. And then, of course, for the guys, you know, a bunch of those problems were, were excellent opportunities for the men to showcase their uh, their stuff most notably for me would be um number four Wait, or uh number four yeah number four just the you know just straight thugging all the way through uh i thought those were excellent so mostly for how much of a you know i think it was a, it was a good comp but the context of it coming out of nowhere after two years and making a, a good comp a good show excellent separation was like chef's kiss uh i think jen hiroshima was the chief hats off to him the crew awesome job big winners it's interesting because one of my takeaways from the comp one of the things i wrote down in my notes was about the setting and my comment was i thought because i thought the problems were in general good but i think for the men's at least the order was wrong oh i think they should have started with number three and then gone to one and then gone to two and then gone to four now the reason i say that is because number one had that effectively morpho start where they were leaping straight to the two red pinches, which was piece of cake if you were Adam, not a piece of cake if you were Sota or Tomoaki yes. or someone. This one. We saw 14 minutes before anyone made it past the second hold. Yes. So for me, that's not a good... From a media and a viewing perspective, that's not a good way to buy people into the comp. Um I think you can have a competition with really hard starts, but you don't want that to be, you know, your first problem should be capturing, capturing people's attention and seeing everyone until, um, 
it was, was it Sota or Yoshiyuki? Oh, uh, maybe Yoshiyuki. I can't remember the order, but yeah. Yeah. Um, seeing everyone until then just fall off without really doing anything was a bit... Uh, but as I said, I think the problem was good. I just think it was the wrong place in finals. Um, yeah. But I, I did put down one thing, um, and this is... Well, I put down two things, sorry. One, I put... Generally, I thought the setting was a little bit more morpho than I've seen in a lot of comps. Um, Do you want to define morpho sure for some one? people that are... It, that word doesn't really get used, especially in North America, that much. Oh, really? Okay. Um, so, basically, there was... So, again, that, that red start uh, for the first men's problem is going to be much easier for Adam and... Um, after Adam for... Nathaniel, because they were the tallest two, they could effectively jump straight up from a static jump and get that pretty well. The Japanese, especially the smaller ones, were having to run, bounce the sidewall, and spring into it. But then they were swinging out and kicking a hold and being called off. But, you know, that was a huge energy output just to get off the ground, which was diminished the taller you were. So that your height made an element of that. And I felt on the second problem as well... Um, when Adam went into the shoulder press, the foot was just in the right place for him. When the other guys went into the shoulder press, it was way over their heads. Mm -hmm. So when, when Adam goes into the shoulder press, he, with his height, his shoulders and his elbows were pretty much in a line and he was able to bring his um, line of his shoulders inside his elbows. For the other guys, they were too short. So it, not hugely morpho, but it was more than... More than I expected. Um, and the last thing I put about the setting, uh, and Nico Janelle commented on this on his Instagram post as well, which I think is really important, is we're seeing too many dangerous problems. Um, you know, you saw Tomoaki Takata definitely got his bell rung on men's four. You saw um, Vita Lucan had a horrible fall, really rung her bell. Um, on was that problem two for the girls? I can't remember the yellow dino -y. Yeah, it was problem two. The, the go yeah. around the corner jump, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And to me, it's if you have to think, well, does our sport need a concussion protocol? Then maybe the setting's not. And, and... Well, first of all, it should have a concussion protocol. Like, that's, I think, you know, that's something at a gym I worked at like seven years ago is something we were working on. So hopefully that's. I don't know, but yeah, probably something to deal with if they don't. Yeah, I, I won't lie. I've seen comps where climbers have not been able to tell you what their name was and they've come out for the next problem. Um, and, I hope and that one's in the book. Jeez. Uh, yep, <laughs> yep, good. that is. Yep, European nice. Youth Champs 2015 or 16. Um, but because when they get driven into very sideways moves, especially high on the wall, if they're out of control, and this is why you see the dislocated elbows like you saw recently from Yinya Kaspakova. This is why you see a lot of knee injuries. Is that they're not, and I'm not saying that we should be setting straight up and down problems, but I think we have to be conscious that if these guys are launching themselves at 10 tenths, what happens to the comp if Yinya does that move foot slips, turns sideways, dislocates their elbow out of the Olympics. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we need to, we need to be considerate of the injury impact of the sport. And I'm not seeing it in the setting. And as I said, Nico Janelle, after the comp, who was one of the French coaches and then a competitor after that, he posted up and just went, the injury is coming. You know, we know it's coming, and we've known it's coming for a while. Um, I will tell you a slight story here. Last year, after um, Vale World Cup, I can't remember. Were you there, John? You weren't, were you? I was not. They had a they had a round table with the IFSC, a couple of the athletes, Sean and Akio were there, um, and then the press, so the Rock and Ice guys climbing, myself, a few others, and we were talking about the direction of sport and asking questions. And... So I stuck my hand up and I said, look, you know, is anyone studying whether certain moves are more risk of causing injuries? And, you know, when they catch a hold and reach out and block hard to stop a swing, is that, you know, are we risking their shoulders? Are we risking their elbows? Um, and I asked the question and 
the moderator just went, if any of the athletes think that that's a question, then they can ask it. And Akio just put <laughs> Akio just puts her hand up. Akio uh. just puts her hand up, and in her not great English, just goes, "What he said." That's amazing. <laughs> and but it was, yeah, like they didn't want the question asked, which I assume means nothing was done about it or nothing was being done about it at that stage. But then Akio just and you know Akio straight away was like, "Look, a lot of our warm up walls out the back of the." Um, venues are vertical or just off vertical on good holds and we can't practice swings we can't practice any of these movement problems and then we go out into a final and the first thing we're doing is full force flying sideways how can you warm that up on a vertical wall covered in jerks mm -hmm. so it was really interesting but um yeah so not to take away with your big winner being the root setting but i think there was areas for development on there sure yeah, no, I think that's like, John, did you have anything to say about that? Because I'm going to pipe in after if you do. Yeah, I I kind of am the same way. Overall, I really like the setting, but I can nitpick a little bit here. Um, I didn't know that Eddie was going to say that or, or any of those references, but I, at Tyler, I think I was texting you or messaging you that I, I did feel like the setting was a little bit unsafe at times, um, and it really hit home for me when Nathaniel was on, I think it was men's two um where he was trying to move and it would cause him to like kind of spin and, and sort of land um kind of funky like sometimes it, you know maybe almost landing on like one foot instead of instead of both feet um which kind of it just made me scared because he's an olympian and particularly because here in the states i don't know if how much this is known on the international circuit but um you know, a few weeks after Brooke Rabatou qualified for the Olympics, she injured her knee pretty badly in a in a national bouldering cu uh, cup here in the United States, and it ended up being far worse than she thought. She had to do, you know, rehab for months. Um, so ever since that has happened, I've just kind of been extra cognizant of like, oh, geez, these Olympians, like, be extra careful in these in these events leading up to the Olympics because that is certainly worst case is that you get it you make the olympics and then you get injured before you can perform at the olympics tyler you and i've said this before um so men's two that spinning move was particularly scary and then i think on men's three um that was when i think nathaniel kind of fell and and landed sort of flat on his back um and that it was, was a long way down one, yeah. yeah the to right it was the the simultaneous like toe toe catch and like a dead point um and he fell and and really kind of slammed his head uh, pretty bad it looked like I mean he seemed okay luckily but it kind of made me wonder geez should they be you know wearing helmets for some of these uh, some of these problems which sounds crazy but then you think about it and then you hear what Eddie said about you know the injuries of the past and stuff so um, so yeah scary falls the only other thing about the setting that I could nitpick at is I I would have liked to see maybe a little bit more separation in the bottom half of the the women in finals I think um, like uh, who was it? Uh, Katya, Vita, and Akio all had zero tops, um, you know, in, for positions six, five, and four in the final round for the women's. Would have been nice to have those kind of a little bit more separate. But again, that is really split in hairs. So that's all I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will come in with one last thing. Um, and I, I put this in my. Where is it? Um, men's semi four. Can the setters get over their crack habit? Um, You're stealing my biggest fail, but do it. Go for it. It didn't. Even, okay, sorry, man. It didn't even look like an aesthetic crack. It was just, it was just grovelly horrible. And it was really interesting having Jakob in commentary, just going, "They don't want that. That's just ugly." Yeah. And totally, I, I was just watching, going, you know, crack climbing is specialist climbing. If we're doing a crack outside, we're taping our hands, we're preparing. It's you, you generally you don't walk up to a crack blind with especially with no tape on and go i'm just gonna you know so i i think the novelty's worn off mm -hmm. i i agreed eddie i you know it was fun in 2019 because it was such a surprise i i don't want to steal your thunder tyler i didn't yeah, know you guys you are wrecking me for the next okay crack. well <laughs> But, you know, it's like it was fun then because it was novel. It was a novel thing. It was surprising. 
I don't think the fun aspect of it was like, hey, this is great. We should have multiple cracks every year at Mayringen. I, you know, um, I'm all for surprises, but but at this point, the the what was surprising has become kind of the norm here, and that takes some, a lot of the fun out of it. So, um, yeah, I agree 100%, Eddie. And now that you and I have spoken on this, Tyler, you can. Uh... <laughs> I will. Tyler, I will make my comments Tyler's later. Tyler's scrambling for a new. I, I, I want to go back to the falls thing because I, that's a, a really interesting. Con- so, like that, my issue with the falls, and it's not to defend my point about whether the root setting was good or not. I, I think, you know, whatever. Everybody can think what they want. I think it was generally good. It's a great point about falls. So my my, I guess what I what I would say is. I think it's something we see in root setting all the time is trying to find the line, um, trying to innovate new moves, um, trying to see where the next, uh, you know, the the next um, frontier is in in challenges that that surprise the athletes, which is where the crack thing is also related to is like, you know, how can we incorporate this into our climbing? You know, we did dinos. Now we're going to do double dinos. Now we're going to do triple dinos. Now we're going to do a triple dino blind, right? Like all these things are just evolving and trying to see where we can, push types of root setting and all of it has certain consequences and the falling is one of them and part of me says you know these climbers should be the best at taking these falls they should be the most adept at coping with this kind of danger far more than you or i or anyone else aside from maybe you know actual parkour pros who rather than climbing stuff for fun they just fall on stuff it seems for for fun um i understand the danger but i I, I don't really know at what point you start taking away from, from setting just to prevent uh, like it's, I just don't know what is an obviously dangerous fall and what is, you know, what's the, what's, are we talking about a one in 100,000 injury versus a one in 10,000 injury? And so the, the last thread I want to talk on that is I think the IFSC is the last set of people to try and figure out what's dangerous and what's not. I think that is like an industry-wide initiative that needs to be taken up on gym injuries is getting gyms together and not like gyms are scared to talk about when people get injured in their gyms, especially in North America, maybe not so much in Europe, but in North America, we don't want to talk to other gyms about, you know, what, what our highest day, not to say we're dangerous, but there are parts of the gym that I work in where more falls happen. And there are parts of my gym where more serious falls happen. And we identify those and we try and take actions. And every year I try and update our injury reporting, but it's really important for gyms to be tracking where do injuries happen? What kind of routes are they happening on? Exactly. What was the nature of the fall? Not just like I was climbing a problem and I let go and I hurt my ankle. I want to know what's the state of the mats. How high were you? Was it an intentional fall? Where is your momentum going? All that kind of stuff. Because how is, you know, some, uh, you know, most of these IFSC root setters have experience setting commercially, but what is the IFSC? see supposed to back up their decisions with if they don't have a genuine pool of info about injuries because these are one in a hundred thousand events for the most part i know that because you know we've mostly looked at the numbers on these and it needs to be you know the commercial setting side that is actually providing that information and saying hey these kind of things you know we have evidence that it leads to more injuries and we can fix it by doing this or that Um, so I think that's, I don't know how the IFSC would answer that question without placing kind of undue burden on the root setters to avoid certain things here or there. I think the root setters are probably pretty good judges. I would be curious to hear how they reflected on that round, but, um, yeah, I think it's a tough fight. And I think that's somewhere where commercial gyms need to be the, the ones providing that answer of, of, uh, what's dangerous and what's not. Um, so that's the only thing I'd mentioned to Eddie's point. Well, I mean, so for instance, the IFSC did ban downwards dinos. Um, That's a classic example of IFSC taking the lead position, Mm -hmm. which is great. Um, I I think it'd be fantastic if they got someone like an Udo Neumann, who's a sports physiologist and really understands movement, and said to Udo, can you watch all these videos from these comps over the last 10 years because, you know, we've seen a lot of elbow injuries, shoulder injuries, knee injuries at the comps. Get a sports physiologist to watch all these things and go, okay, well, it's because their shoulders are forced into this position in this move. Or because they're... And then create a guide for 
the root setters that says, you know, hey, so if you do a move and the shoulders are going to be, the elbows are going to be outside the shoulders, whatever, there's a 75% higher risk of injury than if you do a move. And then get, just give some parameters, and it's not going to be easier. It would have been done already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. On, on the downward dyno thing, though, like we've, we've seen that the, the, um, the nature of that rule be chipped away at slowly as just like what we what we interpret a dyno to be seems to as have changed over time just from when that rule was made it was basically don't have them throw themselves from their hands down to a lower hand position shocking their shoulders and and their upper body but it's not uncommon for us to see moves now where it's their lower body that takes most of the load like basically a dyno where they're jumping down and putting that weight on their feet it seems like you know, we're chipping away at the at the nature of that, trying to decide, you know, well, some downwards dinos are safe, some are not. And I think that's kind of the point is, is like, you know, as these climbers get stronger, as their bodies get more robust in all these different ways, things that were ridiculous to ask a climber to do 10 years ago are like almost rote now. So I, I think it does have to be like somewhat fluid. But yeah, I, I actually seem to remember the downwards dino that ended it for downwards dinos. Um, I remember seeing video of it because it was before my time, but it was a, it was a corner. It was a, and they were dynoing down mm-hmm. into a corner. And I think one of the Russian girls basically got concussed because she just dynoed down splat. Mm-hmm. To, and they're like, you know, just do you remember by any chance down. what uh, what comp that would be for? Because I don't, I don't think I've seen that. I think it was 2011, 2012. Um, best person to ask would be Graham Alderson right. or okay. Udo Neumann. As I said, it was before my time, but there is video of it because I have seen it. Right. Okay. <clears throat> cool. But um, it was it was penis. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> to, to downwards dino into a corner is yeah. way worse than just a normal downwards dino. Yeah, for real. Okay, let's talk about biggest losers. We have to be harsh now. Um, John, you're up. Try not to steal mine again. I've got a couple written down here. Um, I, the first one, there's a little asterisk bes- beside it, which I, I can explain why. And honestly, I'm not even really sure who to who to designate as the loser for this one, but I'll explain what I mean. When I was watching this, I loved every minute of it, as I've already said. Um, and then afterwards, kind of once the the glow sort of wears off a little bit, I was thinking like, oh, this was the it was such a phenomenal comp. Oh, but like, oh, what would it have been like if Tamoa was here? Oh yeah, Tamoa wasn't there. And then I started to think, oh, but, you know, in the women's division, I Mori wasn't here. What if I Mori was here since she's, you know, has she's been doing crushing it at the Japan Cups and stuff like that. Um, and then I started to think, oh, well, yeah, but Jung Won Chan and, and uh, Cheon So aren't weren't there either. And we want to see how Cheon can do on the bouldering circuit. Um, and then it just started going and going. Right. Shauna Coxie's not there. Sean McCall's not there. Alana Yip's not there. Right. So. I don't know whether to say I don't want to call those people losers for not appearing because obviously they all had good reasons to not attend. Right. The covid protocol and all that. So I don't want to do that. Um, I suppose maybe we're the losers because we missed out on getting to watch them perform. Um, But I I just kind of came away from it thinking like, oh, yeah, it was kind of a bummer that we had so many big names not there um, for such a monumental event, right? Like the return to the bouldering comp circuit. Um, that was that was really a bummer. Now, I will say the reason that I have the little asterisk by this is because I've always made a point to not judge a comp by what it is not, right? Don't judge it by who is not there. Judge it by who is there. And so um, maybe this is just sort of like prologue to the other loser categories, that uh, the other choices that I'll mention. Um, I because this one doesn't really count because these people weren't really there, but I will say, you know, they were big, some big names were absent from this and that was too bad. Sure. Yeah. yeah I, I actually, I had written down, there was a men's final and a woman's final worth of past finalists who weren't even there. Yeah. Um, which I, I don't, for me, I don't think is a negative because at least we had a comp. Um, I would have loved it to have been maybe called out a bit more in the commentary with like, you know, hey, you know, sadly, Shauna can't join us and Sean McCall can't join us, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we miss them, but we understand why they're not here. Um, Because one thing you saw in commentary is people going, is such and such here, is such and such here? Mm -hmm. Would have been nice just for the commentators to call it out and say, you know, we're missing a bunch of people, 
but hey, we got a comp. Look at how many people we do have. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just on that thread, something that came up, you know, uh, I wasn't in the YouTube chat for finals or semis. I was with the the Plastic Weekly Discord, and that and that was something that came up. Uh, I think Sitza came in at uh, when finals was over. He hopped in Discord before going to bed, um, and just to give some background on. I think it was the appeal at the end of finals, or or what was rumored to be an appeal slash rumored to be a scoring error or something between Oriane and Natalia. Uh, but the conversation came up of you know. Um, just wanting people on the floor that are getting this information, whether it's about injuries, whether it's about uh, who's here and who's not and why, or about appeals is there are these blank spots in the coverage of these comps where people have questions and it affects the outcome of the sport. And sometimes we're watching the effect of it on the screen with no explanation of what's happening. And it's very jarring. Um, to not understand why Natalia and Orian flipped spots on the scoreboard or to not understand why Tomoa isn't there or to not understand why in qualifiers, this person does three tops, but the person above them only has like one top, like top, you know, yeah. things, things like that. There are, there are critical parts of the sport that still aren't being communicated very well and they're for different reasons, but that's a, a, a great point. Um, uh, to bring up is just what what's the stuff we choose to talk about because there is a lot that would really make it easier to to kind of grasp the full picture. I think that's something that Matt will get a better understanding of in time because I think that was something Charlie was very good at yeah. was communicating what is unseen and having a feel for what wasn't being seen but might be of relevance. And, you know, it's another area where without blowing my own trumpet, they'll miss me because I used to regularly run back to Charlie Mm -hmm. and co-commentator would be talking, whether it be Alana or whoever. I'd run back to Charlie and say, hey, this just happened or such and such isn't appealed. And then I'd run back and keep taking photos so that they had this flow of information. Um, You know, you can't expect Matt to have developed those networks yet because he's new to the job. I thought he did a great job, but it's hard to have that really global perspective until you totally. are, are deep. And, and Charlie was deep, and that's why he, so many people miss him. He's, you know, you remember Charlie's first year of commentary. He wasn't fantastic, and he won't, <laughs> he won't hold a grudge against me saying that because he'll say it himself. But by the second year, he'd done his homework, he'd learnt the sport, blah, 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 and he became fantastic. And, you know, Matt... Does, Matt will be as good, but he's going to have that same growth and development time. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, I, I remember lots of times where Charlie would say, you know, Eddie just walked up to me or Graham just walked up to me and told me this or that or whatnot. And yeah, it's really important. Like, you know, if you don't have a production assistant, which is maybe something that, you know, you could get possibly an IFSC staff member who's not doing much else to help out with, like those are those are things that, that would make a really big difference on the broadcast. But uh, yeah, good point. Um. What about yourself, Eddie, in terms of biggest losers? Um, well, this is where I'm going to be unpopular. <laughs> I was worried um, you were just going to drop a lot of heat, but go for it. Whatever yeah, I, I, I pretty much am. Look, I, I think the biggest losers for me are the IFSC. Um, I think they had this phenomenal chance and to do something special, and they really bit off their nose despite their face for days Hasseltown mountain festival had said we are broadcasting qualifiers we are broadcasting for qualifiers and everyone was so excited because what you have to remember is at qualifiers in a normal world cup you're going to have the athletes are there you're going to have the athletes families will be there quite often from globally you know you're going to have friends have come from wherever to watch so you've got quite a big field field of spectators for qualifiers and they're watching, and that's really important for the athletes because they, you know, if you've got 120 guys competing and 20 make it to semis, that's 100 guys that are invisible. You know, 70 women competing, 20 make it to women's finals, semis, sorry, that's 50 women who are invisible. To have that exposure means that their families who have helped them get there, their gyms that have helped them get there, everyone that have helped them get to the comps, can see them, can sit around, can watch them. And that creates interest in the semis. That creates interest in the finals. So we switch on YouTube. We're excited. And what do we see? You are not allowed to watch this. 
IFSC have blocked this, you know, due to IFSC regulations. This is not po possible right now. So I, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's not... And if you read the YouTube comments, they were all like, what, you know, they were furious. And if you read the comments on my Instagram and various other Instagrams, everyone was, what are they thinking? And then they come in and they're only commentating in German and in French because the IFSC has said, oh, well, you can, okay, you can do the stream, but you can't commentate in English because, you know, people might enjoy it. And it's, I mean, what a huge own goal. Own goal. They had, again, and I think this is a thing where IFSC struggles to work with or trust other entities. And the Mountain Festival had said, we will do a live stream. And the IFSC should have been great. This is promotion for semis and finals. This will get more bums on seats. This will get our sponsors more views. This will get all the sponsors above the walls are going to have more visibility. Not, not just... Boom. And they came out of that just looking, I, I won't lie, not very good. I thought that was a shame because if they had just said, you know what, it's extraordinary circumstances, it's not normal. Normally we don't allow um, qualifying to be shown, but this is COVID. We understand that the friends and family can't be there, so let, let it be shown. And then they advertise it through their channels and win-win and they get more bums on seats. <clears throat> it seems incredibly tone deaf to me that they didn't. So that to me was the first part. And the second part maybe is more production company than IFSC, but I thought the coverage of semis was incredibly scatterbrained. You would start to see a climber move and they were like going into the crux of a problem and then it just chopped to a random climber. And then that climber would start to do something in a chop. And maybe it's time out of the sport that the production team were a bit rusty, but there was no cohesiveness. Um, finals was a great show, but semis was, you know, I actually said on YouTube, this isn't good enough. And I'm a huge advocate of never dissing. But I was like, I'm sorry, this is actually, I almost felt motion sick because um, they were chopping the, the angles so often. And lastly, and it's funny because you talked about the graphics. I thought the graphics were appalling. Okay. Um, because they had, so they'd have, say someone was on two tops and four zones, and they'd have <clears> two <throat> big bars and two small bars. But then they didn't have any attempts or anything like that. And then they had like a total number attempts thing, whatever, which I do not know what the maths they used for that was, but it bore no relation to reality. Mm -hmm. which is where the confusion about Natalia and Ariane came up because they had this culminative imaginary score to the side of them. If you were watching the IFSC app, then you could see that Ariane was ahead of Natalia on attempts. But if you were watching the screen, it was telling you a completely different story. So it was, mm -hmm. there was a, yeah, there was a breakdown there somewhere. It was really confusing. And, um, and that, you know, the last thing I will say is then it comes to the press release at the end, um, which we've already touched on, where they've had, you know, how long has it been since we've had a real World Cup? 18 months? Um, they had one job. They don't get Yanya's consecutive run of victories right. Um, they say that Natalia and Ariane got the same score. And then they say, uh, under that, except Dorian won because of less attempts. Well, then that's a different score. Um, you know, it's it's just... I I expected more. After such a long break, you, you should come in, you know, first day at work, you want to make a good impression. Um, so for me, yeah, that's... I think the biggest single ball drop and the biggest single loser of the competition was just trying to block the live streamer qualifiers and i think yeah from then on in they just didn't improve things much that's entirely fair on the graphics i agree i it it does seem like there has been a decision to try and make the sport only about tops and zones 
and hoping that nothing ever comes down to attempts because we're seeing that reflected in the graphics uh, and and the press release, like you mentioned. Um, I've like years ago, I did a video on on way to present scores, and I don't believe it is that hard, but it it does seem like there is a conscious decision to try and just hope that a score like a, a you don't have to break ties by attempts, um, which is going to be confusing as hell one day maybe not you know this time it was confusing because of whatever their attempts graphic was but if it ever comes down to a tie that's broken by attempts that's going to be a mess um and that's kind of just a, an argument i keep making is that i don't think bouldering is finished as a sport it isn't fully cooked we still have things to learn and different things to try uh to to make it fun to compete in fun to present fun to watch um what was the other point you mentioned earlier on though is about the uh oh yeah about the qualifier stream i i simply don't understand what their preoccupation is with blocking broadcast of qualifiers like a couple years ago we dealt with uh 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 angle from on bouldering dropping out of his incredible youtube channel where he would go and he would record all of the qualifiers and he would present those videos. And later on, he would present kind of highlights from history and he's just gone now. He's not like, you know, he had an awesome following. He was doing incredible content. He was doing great stuff out of Spain. Uh, and, and he was basically told one day, you're not allowed to record these qualifiers and make this content, which is inarguably growing people's interest in our sport. And I don't know why, because who's broadcasting qualifiers? Like, who are you holding these rights for? Like, is there some, like, it's like the shopping channel at like 3 a.m. needs something to show. And so they're willing to, like, qualifiers is really a diehard round, right? It is, like you mentioned, it's the families. It's the most committed supporters of these climbers that watch it. Cause it's not a good show. You can't make a good show out of qualifiers. There's 9,000 climbers on the wall and it lasts like seven hours. Like it's not a good show. So like yeah. who really, like what are we preserving this material for? Are you putting it in a vault for some like retrospective of, you know, problems that nobody's ever seen and aren't very interesting. Well, like I, I truly don't understand the rationale. No, the, the short answer is no, they're not because they're not even recording them themselves. Mm hmm. The IFSC, apart from the judging cameras, which are, of course, videoing individual problems yeah. for judging, the production team will go in and spend five minutes, ten minutes doing a couple of Adam on something, a couple of Yanya on something, a couple of Tamara on something, a couple of Sean on something, and then they'll go. That'll be all you'll see them all day. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying, well, it's a streaming rights thing, and it's like, but you're not streaming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not... There is no competition you're not taking away from another audience because you are quite literally not showing it um and yeah it you know i miss angel like he was great to work with great to have at comps again i felt like myself he was doing a lot for the sport and the ifsc just were like no you can't do this because of streaming rights and it's like oh. yeah it's i i I struggle to understand sometimes, um, you know, and we don't need a fancy stream. A lot of people moaned during the men's qualifying that it was just one angle. Mm -hmm. I don't care. It's fine. One That's angle, the only way you can shoot it. Angle, like, how else are you going to see everything? Yeah. One angle tells me the story. That's all I need. And I can sit there and I can watch my friend and I can go, you know, he's going to do it. He's going, ah. Oh. And then he times out and he walks off. And you're like, oh, well. But I'm connecting with the climbers i'm getting to see what's happening and not just me but yourself um you know people all around the world just so i you know and this year when chances are with the exception of um the u.s there'll be no crowds and world cups are they just gonna not show qual you know the the qualification climbers become the invisible climbers mm -hmm. Do you, um, by any chance, do you happen to know why Epic TV uh, was there and set up? Was it simply that Haslital Mountain Festival reached out to them and said, hey, can you do this? Like, I'm I'm assuming there was an agreement made ahead of time because, you know, I, I, I don't think Epic TV was the team doing the rest of the broadcast unless the broadcast team has changed since previous years. I'm not sure if it's still obsess media doing it or not. I, yeah, I haven't heard anything about that. I would assume it's still obsessed. But um, yeah, I, 
I know nothing about that. Okay. I didn't even know Epic TV, TV were there. Okay. That, that was my understanding uh, that Hospital said that they were basically presenting it with Epic TV as uh, like uh, they were like their partner in presenting it. So I'm, I'm not really sure what the situation is. I might be wrong. They maybe weren't producing it. Maybe they had the broadcast rights. <laughs> I, I think it's, well, I think it's similar to the European Cup the week before where the Austrians did the broadcast and then they just give the uh, um, give the feed to Epic TV so it reaches a bigger audience. Right. Mm. Yeah, that may be it. Yeah. All right. Well, my biggest loser has already been covered, and it's almost you know it's kind of anticlimactic after after just wrecking the entire sport organization for climbing on the planet. But I don't like crack climbing anymore. Is that petty enough as a way to end this episode? <laughs> is crack climbs really, really, you know what? And I, I kind of want to focus it actually on women's number four, I think was, was the best example of it. First of all, you know, in my head, I was kind of psyched up. I liked the idea before the comp started, before we knew that the problems were there. You know what? Last year they introduced crack, crack climbing. It went over extremely well due to, you know, exceptional circumstances of Adam getting the send when nobody else did. And it was the last problem of the comp and he won off of it. Like that worked as perfect as you can get. And I think that set the bar a little too high for our overhyped friend crack climbing. Um, I was kind of psyched that, Hey, maybe they bring it back for the women. We've given them a year to get ready for it. Now that they know we have the holds and we have the, you know, the willingness to put this on the wall, but frankly, the sequel is never as good as the original. And it really showed none of the problems that incorporated it were either fun to watch or fun to climb. And a women's four, particularly, it was an ugly as hell problem. I think it was the standout, you know, ugly duckling of the competition and the crack wasn't even forced. Um, it was very nice of Natalia and Yanya to give it the, um, you know, the, the, the complimentary fist jam for a second and then be like, nah, not psyched. Nah. And just go into yeah. that layback, uh, side pull. Um, so the loser is, uh, wide boys and all the guys hyping up crack climbing as a competition staple, Sorry, the uh, the holiday may be over already. Um, but yeah, probably specifically women's number four, but in general, a little too much hype and uh, it just didn't go in any of the three problems where it was featured. Well, t Tyler, that, that nuance is really important. The fact that you, in 2019, if I remember correctly, you, it's like you couldn't break the beta, right? That was the whole thing with the, all the those Japanese climbers that got up to it and they... They had to try to do it as a jam, and they couldn't. And then Andra comes in and does it and succeeds. Um, so it's it's kind of like the crack climbing, as much as it's a novelty, the novelty only works if you can't break that beta, and you have to have a competitor who comes in there and, and does the jam. It seemed like a lot of these cracks, case in point, um, women's four, yeah, the, the, like you could just break the beta and turn it and turn the the fist jam into a into a double Gaston or whatever. And um, so so yeah, the fact that I, I just think we should underscore the fact that it, it, we we might have thought of it differently if these competitors had to actually do the jam this time in 2021. Sure. But yeah. um, you know, they just all broke it anyway. So well, like look at look at at how the problem was situated, right? It was the last problem of the competition because women went last just as men went last in uh, in Myringen uh, 20. Or wait, was it? I can't remember if it was flipped around. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So it was the it was the end of the whole show. Adam Andra, as it turns out, is coming out last, which the setters can't have known for sure, but it was something they could maybe predict. So in this scenario, you think to yourself, what is the women's field going to look like? You know, it's the final problem, which you normally want to be a good send off, right? It doesn't mean you're going to make it an easy gimme like maybe some American comps occasionally do, but you want that last problem to be something that people remember and something that the winner can celebrate on, right? And so it was set up in the same way that Andra's crack was. And if you look at the field, Yanya Garnbrett experienced in, in climbing outdoors, I'm really not sure how much crack experience she has, but if anybody can pull a crack, she can do it, I'm sure. Like she's just, you know, incredible. So the ingredients were there, but that's, you know, that's the nature of when we when we judge boulder problems based on exactly six people climbing it, the reaction to it's impossible to predict because how are these climbers going to go on it? We wouldn't be talking about the danger of falls if those particular six climbers just, you know, made some of those moves without having to fall on them. We wouldn't be talking about... Um, 
it, uh, any theme about route setting is completely framed by the six particular climbers that get on it right mm -hmm. and it just didn't go this time and that's a risky run but I, I it also looked like right off the bat that it would be much easier to break than the one from last year the one last year was that full length it was pretty much straight up and down um, whereas this one kind of seemed like it was going to be easily breakable the bottom was frankly the the most challenging part and it was the sh like shittest thing to watch climb in like in memory or just like a complete jumble of crap and it was like not fun i don't know yeah yeah no i the cracks that they had this year obviously woman's final four um men's semi, semi four, four. Yeah. they were both quasi cracks they were like a crack move squeezed into another style of climb. Mm -hmm. Whereas men's four in 2019, you effectively climbed into a crack through a crack and out of a crack. Mm -hmm. So you actually had climbing through the crack. These ones, men's four seem to be ugly jam, ugly jam out. And then woman's four seem to be ugly fist jam, mm -hmm. turn it into a um, layback out. So they weren't, they were crack moves. They weren't crack climbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's completely, that's actually a, a good point too. Yeah. Having the men's one in, uh, in semi so low down was also just generally anticlimactic. Like it was like a traverse into a crack, one move and get out. And, and like, if you're fancy, you could just lay back the whole thing and not, yeah, it was, it was a little depressed. I can't remember which one in qualifiers had a crack. I'm pretty sure there was one in there, but, uh, uh I'm not going to remember the number cause it was like 10 of them. So, yeah. you know, screw it. But, Dude. Um, you, you said you weren't watching the YouTube chat uh, for semis. Did no. either of you watch the YouTube chat? When if Go back and have a look at when Adam is doing the crack. Okay. And it is one of the best angry meltdown <laughs> hatred <laughs> sessions you will ever see because they showed Akio doing the fourth problem, which, okay, legit. There's a guy and a girl climbing. Show a key. I'm completely fine with that. A lot of people were the stupid and were really was dope as hell as well. Like that's a problem to watch. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people were like, oh, blah blah blah. And I was like, well, chill, because there'll be a replay. You know, even mm -hmm. if you don't see Adam live, there's only two people on the wall, so the other camera will, will at least have him for a replay. And yeah, they got a replay after the crack. <laughs> <laughs> and all anyone wanted to see was, you know, yeah, fa famous climber, famous for a crack, yeah, doing crack, and no one got to see it because they didn't <laughs> start the, and, and YouTube commentary just melted. There was so, <laughs> so much angst going on, and I, again, that's just, it's kind of like the production team not being soul climbers. They're not in there out of interest so they're missing things that True. the audience who are deeply invested want to see yeah but mm -hmm. it was yeah go back and watch that section it, it just with like the live commentary open on the side it's glorious <laughs> i'll have to check it out maybe they sold the, the the rights to watching that problem to somebody else maybe it just was unavailable who knows i uh, i, I tell you i will say though that i i do like the idea that mayringen has now because of the 2019 crack problem it's developed this uh, sense of just like, oh, there's going to be some boulder here that's going to be sh so shocking that it's going to go viral, like in terms of the route setting. I love that idea. And I think that's great that the setters like want to do something like that. But I just think that you're missing the mark if you're going to kind of pigeonhole yourself into always, it always has to be a, a crack. You know, we always have to have crack climbs at Mayring. And I think, I think that's just, um, you're putting yourself into a box there. Um, when, you know, it, it could be much more fun to just be far more broad with, with kind of the creativity and the, and the, the viral aspect of the route setting. So, and I, I don't think I, I any mean, of us are saying that like crack isn't something we want to see at a competition. Like I'm totally cool with it. I really appreciate root setters experimenting with stuff. I'm just pointing out they didn't work this time. I thought they failed not to say, don't do it again or try new stuff. Just this time didn't fly. Um, I agree that I would like the idea of of different comps having a reputation for for certain things, um, like uh, every year you get a broadcasting fiasco for some reason in Switzerland. But you know things like that. You know, spice it up a little bit. Know what to expect. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually curious because obviously you had this this year, 2017. You had the red card debacle. Mm -hmm. 
uh, also happening in Maringen. You know, it's not going to be too long till they go, actually, this is more trouble than it's worth. Oh, yeah. We're going to hold uh, another studio block style comp or another quiz style comp. We'll get all the climbers, but we won't have to deal with the bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because in, in the last four years of competitions, they've been burnt twice. Yeah. Um, which I think is always a risky run of being the first competition in the series because that's when changes that are implemented first impact. Um, but yeah, I, it can't be fun for the organizers having to deal with that on a recurring basis. No. Um, but now I'm going to go completely sideways and talk about crack again. Sorry. Um, so those cracks were custom poured for 2019. Um, and are like the personal property of like Cheetah, Flathold, those guys who were part of the setting crew. Yeah. And so I think that's why it was those cracks that appeared back again. And they're actually quite special cracks. They're not normal cracks. Um, they actually have some given the foam so that it's more comfortable than wedging your hand between two hard pieces of plastic. So are you um, saying the plastic itself has some give? Yes. Okay, sorry. You said foam, but so the when you put sorry, your hand Sorry, sorry. Well, I, I actually think I can't remember, sorry, because it's been what a couple of years. What I heard is it was the texture I think was a layer softer of, as well. Yes, and I think there's a layer of foam or cushioning between the plastic of the hold and the mount. So there's like just a couple of millimeters of play in there. Um, which means that you don't really need gloves. So right. they're very nice designed. Like I think, uh, I think it was the Flathold guys did it, and uh, beautiful. But I think they're the only ones in existence, which is why they bust them out to use every time. Sure. Hmm. Yeah. Which I think is great. Like I, you know, I've only heard of these things in passing. That there have been some events here or there where you get a custom kind of one-off shape for for an event i think that's fascinating i think it adds a lot of spice and just like as a hold nerd you like the idea of these you know one-off masterpiece creations by by people like whether it's manu or or larry or whoever um Mm -hmm. i think that's a that's a really neat angle to talk about but uh yeah yeah we'll see how uh crack innovation goes um let's let's just open it up for closing remarks um i know we're we're going into veil and i i think that's going to be a very interesting comp to watch in terms of just how it's run. Um, my guess is it runs really well, but for those of us in societies handling the current pandemic in a certain way, we it might be a little bit jarring um, watching the the event and uh, and how it's uh, how it's executed. I know I've got a couple comments from from uh, American friends wondering, you know, if Canadians are going to be there. Um, a bunch of Canadians have permission to go. They're not going to be supported by the CEC for going, but they'll have permission um, to be there. They still haven't registered, so I'm sure that'll be up to them. I'm sure they'll look closely at what the situation is before they go down um, for those that aren't living there already. Um, but uh, but yeah, for you guys, any closing remarks on Maringen or things to look ahead for and watch for uh, Salt Lake? Uh, well, first up, I was going to say you called it Vale, but it is Salt Lake, oh, of course. Oh, pardon me. Yeah. Um, so that was the first thing. Obviously, exciting to see a new venue. Um, I know USA Climbing have worked really hard on getting a new venue, and clearly it'll be disappointing having a limited crowd there. Um, from a personal level, I'm not comfortable there being a crowd at all. Um, I think when you're trying so epically to show how you're obeying COVID regulations, and then you throw 3,000 spectators in the mix, that's uh, it's an invi- invitation for disaster. Um, you know, maybe they could do it. Maybe you have to show that you've had the vaccine and then you can go or something. I, I don't know. But, you know, there are ways that maybe they could do it that would be responsible. But I'm from the outside looking in, it doesn't look good. Um, I don't know that Yanya will win this one. Uh, I'm going to say that right now. Okay. Uh because I don't know if she'll go. Yeah. Can you, uh, do you um, want to expand on that if possible? Yeah, I think for a lot of the Europeans, if they are facing quarantine coming back into Europe, they're going to have to think twice about it. So they're going to get dispensation to fly into US and compete immediately, of course. Um, depending on where they are, and this is 
a constantly evolving thing. So in a month's time, it's going to be different to where we are today. Yeah. But depending on where they are, flying back into Europe, UK, wherever, could be problematic if they have to do two weeks of um, lockdown. Because the US is still considered a high-risk country, that's going to be more tricky for a lot of athletes than Switzerland was. Uh, because Switzerland, the Europeans were already in the Schengen block, so it wasn't difficult for them to move. Um, just a group of countries, effectively, there's no border. They all trust each other with their border policies. So moving between countries is relatively easy compared to going to the country Exactly. It's the actually been much more difficult since COVID, but um, it's still much easier uh so my understanding is that for instance the japanese that came to um to Maringen have to isolate for two weeks on return to japan um now as the olympic gets closer olympic athletes aren't going to want to do that mm -hmm. uh so you know and the the real fact for me and i'm obviously reading into it here but when yanya was like this was just for fun made me think she's not seriously going, I'm going to win the season, I'm going to go all out. She's like, her goal is going to be the Olympics. Right. This this fitted in her schedule. I'm not sure that Salt Lake will. Now, she could turn up, and I'd love it if she does, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if she didn't. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if quite a few of the Europeans didn't. Yeah, it's a sad confluence of events because, I mean, for... For me, you know, if if that's the case, and it's the case for some athletes already, right? You know, we, John and I, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about people like Tamoa and Aimori, people who are in the midst of a, a time in their career where stories can be built. And of course, Yanya is one of those people as well, where we are writing a narrative uh, that's going to be remembered for a long time. And, you know, COVID's one problem enough, but the Olympics is, is, you know, for, for, for me is, is kind of a bummer from this regard where it's something that I'm not going to put an awful lot of weight in, in judging these climbers historically. Um, but it is taking the attention of these climbers, understandably so, because I think the rewards are massive, um, or at least they're supposed to be. So I really hope they are, uh, for these climbers, cause it would be a huge disappointment if, um, you know, if, uh, if they weren't rewarded for, olympic greatness um after really investing in it that hard um but yeah it's if the, if that's the case it's it's going to be a little bit bittersweet um you know having having something like a streak end for for reasons like this it is what it is uh but uh it'll be an interesting little tidbit of history that we'll have to remember for the future so um yeah mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to seeing it yeah. i'm looking forward to hopefully seeing canadians there like there will be probably a couple of those that live there but you know the ones i really want to see are sean and alana um they're allowed to go whether or not they do i don't know but um it would it would certainly be nice to see them back uh back climbing hard again because i've just been watching sean climbing his indoor wall with his hair getting longer and longer and i i, I really want to see him you know get up against some uh, some competition right so yeah i mean it's the only way to tell for sure until now we've only known who was instagram strong yeah as as in all <laughs> that <was> climbing <laughs> But that was the amazing thing about, you know, last weekend is it was the end of Instagram strong. We got to see who could actually climb. Yeah. yeah. John, what about you? You got any, uh, any parting words? Any I'm parting to, words? I'm trying to um, stretch this thing so we can get Eddie back in this. Yeah, get, get Eddie back I'm in being, here. I'm, right? being a, I'm being a recluse. <laughs> you know, for, for a guy like me who loves the history, um, in terms of the, the United States, there's actually probably no better... Uh, or more suitable place to have a, a climbing competition than Salt Lake City because there's a lot of comp history there. Um, in the early 2000s, it was the birthplace of the, the PCA competitions, which were born out of the, the front climbing gym there. Um, and, and, but yet, even going back further, you know, the first major international climbing competition in the United States was the Snowbird event in 1988. Um, Snowbird, the Snowbird Ski Resort is right there near Salt Lake City. So um, it's just really cool. I've been excited ever since I heard that they were going to kind of return to Salt Lake City for comp climbing. I think that's a pretty um, significant occasion here in the United States. Unfortunately, 
COVID being what it is, um, it's it's not going to be kind of like the the grand full fledged return that I think everybody hoped for when it was um, kind of first announced or speculated a few years ago. But um, but it, it, nonetheless, for kind of historical purposes, it's pretty exciting to have a competition climbing um, back at Salt Lake City. Yeah, yeah, for real. Oh. It'll uh, it'll be something to look forward to. Well, I'm not sure uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to get Eddie back in the in the picture in time to uh, to wrap this up, but. It's been amazing having you on the show, and uh, and you know, if uh, if you want to come back for the next one, let me know. We've got other guests that we can uh, hook in, but it's great to talk to you. Um, and of course, we hope you'll see. You, uh, we hope we'll see you um, back on the circuit as soon as possible, um, and look forward to whatever work you're doing. Uh, and grateful also just for you being somebody that's willing to talk about a lot of stuff that not many people are uh, willing to talk about. Which in a relatively small sport like this, there is. Um, uh, you know, a certain amount of gap in coverage, uh, a lot of issues that we deal with and are fighting through. And it's normal for there to be a lot of disagreement and, you know, um, just different takes on how to make the sport grow. But it's uh, it's kind of important that those discussions get disseminated to everybody in the community, in my opinion. So I'm glad you've been, been somebody, somebody that's willing to talk, talk about this stuff, stuff and, and, and you can, can kind of talk about it from a lot of different angles. angles. So great, great having you. you. Um, hopefully we'll have you back soon. Um, yeah, fingers crossed. It's been a pleasure being here, and I'm honestly really not up to much while I'm stuck here in New Zealand, so available to chat whenever, and yeah, sorry if I came across a bit bitter in the early part, but obviously there's a, a wee bit of residual anger in there, um, but yeah, I'm just I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to come on and chat about the comp, psych that comp climbing's back, and can't wait for the next one. Yeah. yeah. Um, John, great, great having, having you as always. Uh, we'll just, just do the final shout outs. First of all, if you've watched two hours and five minutes into the show, you're a diehard. Um, make sure you join the Plastic Weekly Discord because uh, you're the kind of person I want to talk to. We had a great time watching uh, Marion get together, uh, whether it's in text chat or voice chat. It's a really fun group of people who like talking about you know all different types of climbing and not just the stuff that's going through the, the crazy youtube uh, uh chat room um and of course if you want to uh, support this channel you can uh, you can hop on patreon and uh get stickers and ask questions on the show big uh, thank you to uh to patreon supporters especially to the g5 for uh, for their support and of course make sure you subscribe to this channel for uh, for everything else that comes next give it a like leave a comment if you want i probably won't read it because I just don't. John will. John will like it though. John, I'll will read like it. Comment. Yeah, John yeah. will read it, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna ignore it. So anyway, thanks very much for watching the debrief. Thanks to uh, Eddie and John, and we'll see you guys after Salt Lake City in the next one.